let's be real. Lawsuits are no fun, but with Paulson and Nace, at least they are a little easier. With two DC-born partners, Paulson and Nace will fight for you the way only a Washingtonian could. Paulson and Nace handles medical malpractice, wrongful death, and other complex injury cases involving negligence. So if you have been hurt or lost a loved one because of someone else's mistake or negligence, call Paulson and Nace for a no-obligation consultation. Visit www.paulsonandnace.com or call 202-463-1999. Hey folks, interim executive producer Julia Karen here. In today's Roundup episode, we talk a lot about the GW encampment and MPD's response to it, but there's been a really important update since we recorded the show during the day on Thursday. Late last night, around 200 protesters rallied outside of University President Ellen Granberg's house. That's at 1918 F Street Northwest. They set up nine tents and promised to rebuild the encampment that police had cleared the day before, the one that they cleared at 3 a.m. on Wednesday. Police blocked off the area as the protest grew. As of this recording, at 11 p.m. on Thursday night, we don't know if MPD disbanded the protesters or how long into the night it continued. But we'll be watching through the weekend and we'll continue covering this story. Subscribe to our newsletter at dc.citycast.fm for more details. All right, Mike is going to take it from here. Today on CityCast DC, we are talking about a big plan for DC's Chinatown. We're talking about the controversy over DC police and the George Washington University protesters. And we're going to talk about the cost of Uber. I'm here with my CityCast colleagues, Ash Durbin and Julia Karen. Today is Friday, May 10th. I'm Michael Schaefer, and here's what DC is talking about. Hey, Julia. Hey, Mike. Hey, Ash. Hey. Did you guys see the stuff about Chinatown? Do you guys hang out in Chinatown much? I do. As a long-suffering and then once-winning Caps fan, I am a frequenter of Chinatown, so it's important to me. You know, I used to go to the Planet Fitness in Chinatown when I was living on Capitol Hill, and I actually spent quite a quite a bit of time there and I was actually there last week and actually kind of had a fun time at a bar it was it was it was strange wait so you would commute to a different neighborhood to work out I was traveling quite far for the for the ten dollar monthly fee but <laughs> I see. but it, I see. that's a uh, you know that's a lot so remember when they were gonna move the teams to Virginia <laughs> and everyone was sad and the mayor at that time convened a bunch of bright people, led by a pair of developers, planners, et cetera, to talk about ways of reviving Chinatown, which had become a pretty wide consensus. It had become a place that was much less pleasant for like visitors, tourists, suburban sports fans to come. And then the team came back and everything was back to normal, <laughs> except that they actually <laughs> made a plan and it's got some kind of cool stuff in it. The idea would be to turn 8th Street, which is the road that runs through the portrait gallery and... I mean, it, it bumps into and is interrupted by the Portrait Gallery and Museum of American Art. To turn that into sort of a north-south thoroughfare going all the way from the Convention Center down to like the Hirshhorn Museum, call okay. it Gallery Walk, you know, make it a pedestrian street in the middle with just like one lane of traffic and parking on each side. I used to work in that neighborhood. It's not a, a very pedestrian -y street, particularly north of the uh, Portrait Gallery. And that's kind of a cool idea. And, and I think the idea is to sort of lure people from the mall up into the tax producing part of the district. <laughs> right. And then at the same time to turn the square around the Portrait Gallery and American Art Museum into like a sort of civic space mm. a la, I mean, the examples they used were like- Paris. Covent Garden. <laughs> yeah. The area around the Pompidou in Paris and Bryant Park. And so, and I'm having a hard time like envisioning yeah. it, but again, the, the, the principle of it seems, uh, seems pretty cool to me. Yeah. I like the theory, which is like their goal, right? Obviously is to get people from the mall to the areas where people should spend money <laughs> and help us out. Right. Like that's, that's the ultimate goal here. I like it. One other thing that they mentioned, we talked a lot about office to residential 
conversions. I don't know if y'all want to live in the former uh, J. Edgar Hoover building. <laughs> mm, some scary ghosts in that building for sure. Some of that stuff seemed a little less likely to happen than others. But yeah, there was they identified a lot of potential office to residential conversions. Obviously, they're, the other thing they're doing besides making it a, a place you might, you know, if you're, you're visiting D.C., you might want to stroll, is making it look like a much more attractive neighborhood, give it a kind of branding that would make people want to move there. You know, the only thing that's missing is the actual apartments and units for them to live in. There's currently, you know, a few thousand people who live around there. It should, could be much more. So, you know, you can kind of see that, that happening, the quote unquote dodginess of it, I think, has, you know, has been one, like kind of crimes of opportunity in that there's like just there's a lot of people walking around. And so if you want to, you know, shake someone down or something. Um, and then two, it's like, you know, it is a place where like, I don't know, teenagers without a whole lot to do go and then do you know, sometimes act like knuckleheads, which I certainly did as a teenager. <laughs> and particularly at a time when there's a lot of weed smoking in the street and stuff. And I think that's that's a thing where like our, I mean, Bridget and I did a whole episode about this, right? That we, like, we haven't quite agreed as a society on like what the rules ought to be, what types of behavior when you see other people do them, should you just be cool with and what types, you know, will make people feel uncomfortable. And since you know, comfort, it's not like a legal definition, but it, it does either cause people to come to a place or not come to a place. That's like a factor in all this. That's, you know, and I, and I, I suspect that part of the idea of, of, of making a much more civic public space is to kind of, you know, effectively do some, just do like a sociology experiment that if there's like, you know, if you, you feel like you're in a more majestic space with more programming and stuff, are you even as a knuckleheaded teen gonna sort of subtly get the point that maybe you should do your knuckleheading someplace else. I'm also kind of imagining like, it feels like there's like, we're at the one end of the spectrum now where like this work hasn't started. And then like the end goal is like Paris, you know? And we feel so <laughs> far away from that. I mean, in their defense, they also cited like Milwaukee. Mm. So like, it's not like, they're not entirely taken on airs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I'm imagining like, you have to imagine it would like fall in some middle ground there. And like, what would that look like? And like, yeah, maybe that's Milwaukee, you know? <laughs> I mean, look, it, these are these are plans. And to their credit, the people involved in the plans, a lot of them actually have a history of building things and turning a very nice profit. Like the, the CEOs of Edens and former of, of Forest City are involved. So it's not just like well, if the three of us <laughs> some stuff up. Hmm. <laughs> it's contingent on getting a bunch of real estate together to have people live in. Um, probably contingent on some political changes, which I think I think the environment in DC is such that the, the local like changes could be done very easily. Um, the national environment could change a lot at the next election. Um, Trump uh, was dead set against moving the FBI out of DC. I, th I think that was because the foremost idea at that time was to use that site for a new hotel and he didn't want competition for the one he owned. <laughs> Since he doesn't own it anymore, it could be different. Yeah. I think the big question is like, do we think people are really going to be forced to come back to the office five days a week? Um, no. Right. Like, yeah. and, and because of that, obviously like the government has had to do a big time hard pivot and realistically the, the outcome of this is like, do we actually think there's enough political will to make this stuff work, to like make these thoroughfares happen, to get these conversions to happen, all that kind of stuff. I kind of think that the not that knowing that people are never going to come back to work like before, that's going to help the mm. politics of it. Like, look, if you have a city like Washington, right, where there's just endless numbers of office jobs, the government is not, you know, despite the best efforts of some people in politics, the government's not going to go away. You could just, you know, anytime there's some fancy plan, right? You could just say, no, like save the money. People are going to come to the office. We'll get like rent on the office. People are going to go home. It's all good. But now that argument's kind of gone away. So you really have to do, you have to scramble to create like a festival city to create. A, and I, I think that, that even, maybe especially if people aren't coming to offices, there is still sort of a human urge to be around like-minded people and to be around, you know, vibrant places. Some of it as where you're going to live, some of it where you're going to hang out. Um, and, you know, there's something sort of sad about uh, having a city that's just spectacle and not, uh, you know, nothing else economically productive. But I think they've got to bank on that and they've got to sort of will that into being. Mm -hmm. 
David, thanks for chatting with me. So like you and I both have cars in the DC metro area and sometimes they're great, but sometimes they can be a hassle. And I heard you had car issues, man. Yes, my car like me is old and falling apart. (laughs) And so I wanted to get it fixed. But one of the truly unpleasant tasks I find in the world is getting your car fixed because you have to take it usually somewhere extremely distant, extremely inconvenient, arrange some alternate form of transportation. And so I heard about Rota, Rota Rota.com. And I went on the Rota.com website and they will come and pick your car up, take it from you, and then do the work and bring it back to you. And so I made an appointment on Roto, which was easy as pie, beautiful user interface um, for the work that I wanted done. The valet showed up at around 10 o'clock at my house as exactly on time, very easy, just handed him my keys. He drove off with my car. About an hour later, April called me She said, here are some things that we found with your car in addition to what you want to do. She sent me videos that Michael... Wait, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a car nerd, so I like want to know the nitty gritty of what's happening because I I don't know stuff. A million percent. They sent me this video. There was a particular belt that was had broken and they sent me a video of it and they sent me a list of sort of here are the things that were recommended. Here are the things that seemed urgent to fix and I could choose what I wanted to fix and sent that back to them, which took me like three minutes. Michael, the technician, fixed it. They then texted me and said, oh, your car's on the way back. My car was back in front of my house at 2.30. I'd given it to them at 10. It was back in front of my house that afternoon. Also, note, the valet did a much better job parking in front of my house than I do. (laughs) Don't they always? So much closer to the curb. And it was an incredibly pleasant, super easy experience. And they were very trustworthy. They were clear about what they were going to fix. And it was incredibly convenient. Yeah. So this like seems like a dream. Uh, I have used them before, but it's been a bit. Would you use them again for something like this? I would use Rhoda again in a second. I would use Rhoda. And they have a discount for us too, for CityCast listeners. So if you go to Rhoda.com, they have the discount code CityCast20 and you get 20% off. Sweet. Uh, Plots, David, thank you so much for talking with me. Again, CityCast listeners, you get 20% off off any Rhoda service up to $100 using the code CityCast20. So go to Rhoda.com. That's R-O-D-A dot com to book your appointment. All right. So on the, on the less optimistic uh, pieces of local news, the stuff at GW, it's going to raise a ton of questions for, for people who didn't follow it. There's been an encampment at, at George Washington University protesting the war in Gaza and but just like a lot of universities. In this case, the GW president said, this is trespassing, this is making making it unsafe for our students, et cetera, et cetera, and we want the police to come in, which is like a very controversial decision given the nature of universities and so on. But unusually, in Washington, the police said, nope, uh, we think this is peaceful, we're not uh, going to come in. And uh, uh, DC police have a lot of experience with protests and, and, and so on. But of course, DC police are in DC, which is not a state. And so Congress became involved, it became a subject of some grandstanding. They were going to call the mayor of DC before Congress to sort of dress her down for not answering the call of the GW president. And then did go in, made a bunch of arrests, dismantled the encampment. The hearings in Congress were canceled. Yeah. I mean, I feel like Bowser, Mayor Bowser, is between a rock and a hard place on this one, generally, right? Because originally... Their le- her whole thing was like, well, like MPD said, no, we don't need to go. GW has their own campus police force. Mm-hmm. If GW wants to send in their police force, they're happy to do so. I imagine part of the reasoning that the stance change is like, you know, students are marching to the school president's house and yelling at her. And also this call from Comer to like sit before a congressional committee and be like answer for the fact that you won't send in cops when a bunch of other universities have sent in cops. I mean, look, there's this debate everywhere, right? Should a university president call in the cops? Universities are not just another, they're, they're, they're a special kind of community where like, in theory, there's more space for dissent where you don't, you don't resort to law enforcement. And that decision is really fraught and painful. The decision of the DC cops is a more interesting one. Like, it's not the DC cops' job to decide what kind of community a university should Oh, absolutely. Be, right? It's the university's job to decide that. And, and if they, you know... Let's say you think it's a dumb decision, to, a bad, immoral decision to call in the cops on a university. It's the university's job to make that decision. Shouldn't the D.C. cops just treat GW like any other 
property owner. You know, like if if uh, the Karen family's lawn is being uh, encamped upon oh and they call the police, the police in theory should say like, well, here's a property owner. Someone's trespassing and we're going to and we're going to answer their call. That's like one argument. What's the other argument for, for why they shouldn't have come in? So the argument that we heard from Peter Herman when we did this episode last week was that the optics of D.C. police coming in were going to be compared in large part to the George Floyd protests, right, where you have people, you know, having being pepper sprayed, being tased. And, and nationally, that gets a ton of play. So the optics of it, of going into a campus that is private property, especially when D.C. I mean, going in with invitation. Right. I, I mean, but D.C. is in the state. And so you have this like play acting cosplaying from Republican members of Congress being like, we're going to bring you before a committee to like explain why you can't do this. And, you know. What I was trying to get at is why would the why did the D.C. cops say no? Did they um, given that, like the facts of the matter were it's a private property owner who wants you to get trespassers off their property? And that's kind of what the police are for. Why did they say no? So originally it was just that GW has its own police force. The thing that changed for Pamela Smith and she had a press conference with Mayor Bowser about this was that the decision to clear the encampment and to make the arrests was made on Monday and basically she said that police had evidence that demonstrators were preparing to occupy an actual campus building, like be mm -hmm. inside the physical property. So not just like on the lawns or in the quad or anything like that, but like in a physical building. Um, also that they had amassed items that could be used as weapons. And I think once the police said that they had crossed that line, that was when they were like, all right, like no more messing around. We're coming in. So I don't mean to be all like theoretical about it. I just think that this question of like, would they have behaved differently if the private property belonged to, you know, a, a, an individual homeowner or a, you know, restaurant or or uh, something other than a university? And should that be the police's decision to make? And again, I think, I mean, look, MPD had a pretty ugly history with like the, you know, years ago, the protests at Pershing Park, uh, when there was, uh, you know, really inappropriate excess used. I am glad that their instinct is to, you know, let peaceful protests be, um, um, even if there's powers that be who, who want it the other way. But this question of what, like, what is their job when we're talking about private property is one that I think is, is really, is really interesting. I, you know, if I was a university president, I would desperately not want to call in police on my own community, but that's, you know, that's her decision, the university president. Um, fascinated with the MPD's thinking on this. I think you have to think probably they would have come in quicker if it was someone's house or a restaurant or something. I think, like you said earlier, like this idea that like a university is a place for like learning and protest. And like, I think we can't underestimate how much that played a role. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the optics thing is interesting, too, because it's like that is what we heard from Peter as like the reason they didn't move in. And then this decision to move in like early in the morning before this hearing. Also, like optics wise, I think kind of looks pretty bad, too. Well, it looks like these guys from Kentucky are calling the shots on what ought to exactly. be a local policing decision. Right. And, I, you know, again, even if it was a bad local policing decision, it should be, you know, they're not holding hearings on whether the Louisville police chief is doing the right thing. Yeah. And then, you know, I've seen discourse about this that like brings up the statehood question like i think you mentioned earlier and you know dc's autonomy and you definitely don't want this to be something that sets a precedent for you know congress having dc under its thumb even more when was the last time you went to the theater well, we have a new show for you to check out. The Gala Theater in Columbia Heights is showing the political musical comedy Museum in the Closet, A Vida's Return, which follows Argentine icon Eva Perón to the afterlife as her preserved corpse ignites political scandals, clandestine affairs, and mysterious murders. The show is full of samba, reggae, and tango that will have you tapping your feet nonstop. The show is in Spanish with English surtitles and will run from May 9th through June 9th. Get your tickets now at galatheater.org or call 202-234-7174. 
It's time to get dressed up, DC. So Others Might Eat is having its Young Professionals Network Spring Soiree. That's to help raise funds for homelessness in DC. The gala is on the evening of May 17th at the National Museum of Women in the Arts. There will be live music from DJ Heat from the Washington Wizards, photo booths, food, and even a special appearance by a former actor from Pretty Little Liars. Wow. There will also be a canned food drive, so be sure to bring a few cans to support Sum's Food Pantry. Grab tickets before they're gone at sum.org slash spring soiree. That's S-O-M-E dot O-R-G slash spring soiree. See you there. We had a good conversation a couple of weeks back with the head of Metro about challenges, their budget, and their efforts to get service back to a high level, even if the rush hour commute is not at a high level. Some of their private sector competition uh, also having challenges. Uh, our friend Anna Spiegel had a piece this week about increased Uber wait times, which as if you have sensed that your time waiting for Uber has grown, you are correct. Yeah, it's weird. There's a myriad of factors, according to the article. I think the biggest thing is these shorter pickup distances. Mm. So like drivers don't want to drive across town or if you're in some, you know, random spot that's not so popping, they don't want to go all the way over there and pick you up. I guess that's just more work and the similar amount of money for them. And, you know, that's less drivers in the, you know, less populated areas. Surge pricing is also part of it, obviously. It's funny because Lyft is seeing the opposite effect. And actually, I don't know if you guys have both on your phone. Oh, I but do. But I'm always like switching back and forth. I'm like, Uber is $40? Nope. Lyft is $25. They also talked about like, because it's summer, there's more events, harder to get a ride. You know, people are out on the town more. But look, um, a lot of people in by now have based their decisions about where they're going to live and their patterns of where they're going to hang out on the fact that Uber exists. Right. That you can live in a place that has less transit accessibility, you know, like the far east end of the hill or something. And instead of having to like, you know, count on some taxi dispatch service, sending someone eventually, you can call an Uber. Do people think we're looking at like a, a permanent change or, you know, is this a cyclical thing or, or, or is this a thing where like a lot of people are going to be now regretting, you know, where they chose to get an apartment or buy a house? I mean, I'm definitely going to be regretting it when the Tacoma Metro shuts down this summer <laughs> and I'm relying on Lyft to, to, I guess my social life is just out the window completely. No, Randy Clark told us that it was going to be better than ever. They were going to have dedicated bus lines and it was going to, you know, <laughs> you're right. Like, what are you too good for the bus? <sighs> I'm not too good for the bus. You're right. I can, I can get my butt on the bus, but I don't know. I take Lyft quite a bit late at night when the Metro is closed and I have to get mm. back to Tacoma park. There's no worse feeling than being like, you know, 3 AM and being like, 25 minutes until you yep. pick me up you know like that 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 sucks i don't know i feel like we've lived through this before and it swings back but we'll see i mean you're talking about coming completely full circle the curb app is there for taxis and yes. people say it's like cheaper and more reliable so we've gone from wait do you use that i don't i'm gonna try it though i i so i looked this up when i was studying this story i was like what other options do people have besides uber and lyft uh obviously there's the e-bike rentals go listen to my episode about that and rent some e-bikes but yeah, I found the Curb app, which is pretty much Uber and Lyft, but like for literal taxis. And some people say it's cheaper and more reliable. So I'm going to download it and see what happens. But I just can't remember the last time I've taken a real taxi. I know, same. Pro tip from a man who lives in Tacoma. Thanks, man. Of course, dude. All right, so you know what you don't have to wait for and what doesn't have surge pricing? Our membership plan. Yeah. Julia, what is the membership plan? All right, so for as little as $8 a month, you get ad-free episodes which is a big deal for us. We love that for you. That's like a third of an Ash Uber ride. It is a third of an Ash Uber ride. Maybe a fifth. Probably, yeah, one sixteenth of an Ash Uber ride, maybe. Depending on how late I'm coming home. <laughs> I know. You also get exclusive first dibs access to events that we hold, which is really cool. And also you help power the thing that we do. We love making the show. We love Kayla, who makes our newsletter. And you guys help power us do that. So if you want to become a member... Head to membership.citycast.fm and choose your tier. We have two tiers. There's Buds and Peak Bloom, you know, playing off the cherry blossoms. We we know you all love that. Love a little pun. So Sign go up. do it. Yeah. A lot cheaper than booking an Uber, I'll tell you that. 
All right. Thank you, Julia. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Ash. Good to see you, man. Good to see you, too. And that is all for today here on City Guest DC. Our interim executive producers are Julia Karen and Kayla Cote Stemmerman. Kayla also writes our super informative and fun newsletter. It's called Hey DC. That's H E Y D C. Our interim producer is Ash Durbin, and our hosts are Bridget Todd and me, Michael Schaefer from Politico. Music is by Alex Roldan. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe. Subscribe to our morning newsletter. We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. Bye.